Hello and welcome to the Next Level Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Miller, and I'm going to be here with my buddy, Jonathan V. Last, and my aspiring buddy, Frank Bruni of the New York Times. Frank was the first openly gay New York Times columnist. Uh, Now he's a newsletter at the Times. He has a beautiful book, which we talk about, called The Beauty of Dusk, which deals with physical deterioration and how he dealt with that after he had a stroke and speaking to others. Uh, He's also a professor at Duke, so we get into a bit about campus politics. Uh, We do plenty of politics altogether, actually, so uh, we're just going to spare you the intro and get right into it. But first, if you haven't liked us, if you haven't commented, subscribed, please do. YouTube, Spotify, Apple, and, and most importantly, share share this with a friend. Uh, you know, We're hoping these interviews can bring some new people to the bulwark, new people to be introduced to Charlie Sykes' daily podcast, Beg to Differ, Sunny Bunch's podcast, our whole suite of you know, ear joy that we bring you every week. Um, so one other thing, I have an article out on Thursday if you missed it. Uh, and if you want to see what it's really like for somebody to be a victim of politicized justice, I want to introduce you to Jordan Hamlet. His story is a lot different than a little whining and complaining we've been hearing from old Donnie Trump about the way the Justice Department has been to him uh, over the past week. So enjoy all that. Uh, we're up to Frank Bruni next. Uh, but first... Our friends at Acid Tongue, and happy Easter. Hey, Frank. Thanks so much for doing this. Uh, I'm so grateful you were our Sloppy Seconds guest for the week, and it's just my honor that you are willing to do that. (laughs) It's my honor to be Sloppy Seconds. (laughs) I'm I'm forever grateful. Usually usually I'm nasty thirds, so I'm moving (laughs) up in the world. Um, we are, uh, we're taping this minutes after, uh, we just saw the first surreal photos of a former president as a criminal defendant, 34 felony counts in New York. New York will get you like that. Um, the Bulwark's going to have wall-to-wall coverage of this all week. This is airing on Sunday, but I am curious, just your, your very top level thoughts, 30,000 feet on, <laughs> on the scene, what's happening, our um, life. I, I, well, I, I'm going to. I'm going to say something that probably is not what you want to hear, but um, I, it feels strangely anticlimactic to me, hmm. if that makes any sense. I, I just I'm at a point now, and I don't think uh, I don't think I'm alone. I think I speak for probably many Americans where I, I'm so exhausted by the Trump melodrama. Um, I feel like we've seen versions of everything before. I know this is the first former president, you know, to be criminally indicted, criminally arraigned. I understand the history of it, and all of that is important, but. In some weird ways, this just feels like the latest inevitable chapter of the Trump saga. And I've always maintained that kind of one of the most insidious things he's done is he's just so overwhelmed us, you know, with all of the drama, with all of the offenses, that it, that it blurs together and becomes a kind of wallpaper paste after a while. Mm-hmm. And so I want to feel more, I don't know whether it would be called excitement or outrage or whatever than Glee. I do. But uh, yeah, well, Glee, but Shot I just... Voice. I'm just wrung out. I don't, does that resonate for either one of you? That does not the resonate good news for is me. You only have two I'm... more years to to endure this for. <laughs> Six. And so, you know, well, by, second is by next ben, presidency. everything will be behind us. You know, they're going to get rid of this son of a bitch for us. <laughs> um, I hear you. I, it resonates for me in that I understand the this, this sentiment. Maybe it's just a little bit, you know, the personal element. It's a little bit more of a family feud, you know, having, you know, been cast out of my birth party over this person and, you know, having friendships lost over this person and having, you know, been, and, and, you know, feeling like you're right is really not a nice feeling. So mm-hmm. maybe this is, maybe it's my own ego that makes me feel in a different way that I just, I love my, I, I want to bathe in my rightness right now. Um, but I, I do understand your, uh, your, your, getting t- your weariness over it all. But, but, but here's the thing. You, you can bathe in that rightness, but the people who are, who are in their wrongness are not going to acknowledge your little bubble bath, right? I mean, that's why this doesn't feel like any sort of conclusion because yeah. um, the fact that Alvin Bragg indicted him, the fact that he's been arraigned, to the true believers, to the people who have decided that Donald Trump is their horse and they're going to ride him to wherever he's bringing them, this does not change anything. This does not mean, oh, we were wrong. This does not even mean that his political career is over. You know, yeah. Frank, though, here's the here's the thing. What what I think bothers certainly me, and I think Tim, though, isn't the true believers. The truth is I kind of respect the true believers, like the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world, because at least they're telling you whoa, what whoa, they whoa, actually whoa, 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 whoa. think. Whoa, did you just say you respected Marjorie Taylor Greene? 
I mean, I respect her insofar <laughs> as that she's not running some double game where she knows one thing but is saying another thing because she's trying to affect a quadruple bank shot to, to get to this fifth thing. And, you know, like, okay, like they're crazy people and crazy people genuinely believe crazy things. What bugs me, and I think bugs Tim, is that you have this entire class of people who absolutely know better and who know that he's guilty of sin and who are desperate to get rid of him and all of that stuff. And they will not only not admit to any of this stuff publicly, even though they privately say it all the time, they go around attacking anybody who is actually trying to do the right thing by seeing justice done against Trump, even though, again, they are desperate to see Trump have justice done against him. And that's that's the really painful part of it. Hello, Kevin Come McCarthy. Here. Yeah. Yeah. The li that list is long. Okay. I want to go to the other side. I was interested in one of something you wrote recently. Um, there are two things you wrote recently that were a little bit against the liberal pieties, little conventional wisdom. You're in you're in North Carolina now. Who knows? The stuff is rubbing off on you, maybe. First was Biden at eighty. Um and and you essentially wrote that that you were sympathetic to or maybe even agreed with i'll let you speak for yourself the idea that he should make the challenging decision to step aside because of his age and um i'm interested in you know where why you feel that way and yeah, well, uh I, I think i think he should step aside um uh so i'm not just sympathetic to that i, I think he should um and it, it relates back to what we were just talking about um uh, I think as with the last election, as with the 2020 election, I don't think we can afford right now um, to have a Republican win the, you know, win the presidential contest, because it looks to me like that Republican will have made compromises and sacrifices and, um, and, and, and done the sorts of quadruple quintuple bank shots that you were all, you, you were both just talking about. Um, and I feel that it's too much of a risk to have Biden run. I, I know that seems like that's got that counterintuitive or wrong because he's the president. He's got, you know, in, in certain ways, you know, he's got the most stature in certain ways. Uh, it would seem like he's the best bet. Um, but I, he, does not, he does not seem to me as steady on the public stage as he was in the past. Whether that is a substantive observation or whether that's optics doesn't really matter in terms of how voters perceive it. Um, and I think when people say, well, but who else? We don't have anybody else. We, we and in that sense, I mean, Democrats. You can't know who else you have until the stage is cleared. No one can really emerge as a viable and vital candidate as long as Biden is in the center of the stage. So for me, it's just all pragmatic. It's I think at this juncture in time, given the corruption, um, the indecency of so much of the Republican Party, I think a Democrat has to win the White House for all the party's flaws, which are which are many. Um, and I just think Biden is actually risky at this point. Kamala doesn't make you scared a little. I mean, that's not exactly. I'm a not sure. sure. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Did I say that Kamala would take his place? I don't think. I just think it's, and I mean, the vice president is a black woman. I, I just think she would be an overwhelming favorite. Were he to step aside to be the nominee, it's hard to imagine who is going to like to come up with somebody that would be beating her in a primary in South Carolina. Uh, how's that hard to imagine given her performance in the 2000? Uh... 20 primary. Well, it was no, I better mean, than I mean, Joe Biden's performance in the 1988 primary. <laughs> no, but I mean, well, yeah, but that, you know, there's, there was a lot of di distance between 1988 and 2020. Um, I don't, I don't sense, um, I don't sense broad support for her in the party. And I think if Biden stepped aside, step, stepped aside, meaning said, I'm not going to do it again early enough. I absolutely think there would be people who would challenge Kamala. Um, and I think there's a decent chance she would not end up with a nomination. And I don't say that with pleasure or with displeasure. I'm just telling you what I see when I look at the at the players in the yeah. field. So I, I, I agree on the merits there, Frank. Um, but what worries me about this when I when I game this out is so if the sitting vice president fails to uh win the nomination of her party because the sitting president vacates his office or not vacates, but declines to, to seek reelect. That means that we have a pretty bitter primary fight, right? And I assume it means at least a two way, but possibly a larger than two way hard fight. And you, you know, the most important power of incumbency is, is universal name ID. And then the fact that you emerge without having any primary challenge with a unified party. And so you have, you know, like two years to unify the party ahead of the election versus the opposing party, the, the insurgent party having like three months, right? Really from the 
from the convention to the November election. And to give that up, especially in a moment where, for all we know, Trump winds up with basically a coronation, right? I mean, who knows? <laughs> Maybe may, you could imagine a world in which the, you know, the insurgent Republican is Trump. He is nominated basically by acclamation mm -hmm. with nothing but a pro forma challenge uh, and broad 60 percent support from Republican Party voters. And then you have a fractured Democratic Party. Does that worry you at all? It worries me a little bit because you have to be worried about everything. And there's there is much <laughs> there's much historical truth to what you say. But there are also asterisks and buts to that. Right. I mean, the, the 2020 Democratic primary um, up to a certain point in time looked pretty bitter and had many, many candidates and was divisive and all of those things. And Democrats rallied big time around Joe Biden at the end of the day, right? Um, there are any number, the 1992 Democratic primary was not exactly a merry and united one. And Bill Clinton ended up being elected president. There are many, the 2016 Republican primary was ugly as ugly can be. And Donald Trump ended up winning the White House. So while there's much historical truth to what you say, there are exceptions to that rule. And we're living in an era where political rules are being broken all over the place all the time. I don't know how much precedent binds us anymore, given the uh, given the changes in our world, the changes in the media ecosphere, social media, given the metabolism of the world these days. I don't know how much we can look to the past to predict the future, but I also think the past is a mixed lesson in this regard. I wonder, um, I want to get into your book a little bit later, but a lot of the theming about your book is is kind of meditating on aging, thinking about aging, speaking to, you interviewed you know, older people going through decline. I'm just wondering if that influences the way that you kind of assess Joe Biden or, or makes you think about it in a way that's more nuanced than maybe you might have five years ago. Well, if anything, it inclines me more favorably toward him. Um, uh, despite what I'm saying, there's actually yeah. a, there's there's actually a chapter in my book where I talk about him and Nancy Pelosi and what both of them show about the the merits and upsides and wisdom of aging. You know, I think I think Nancy Pelosi was able to muster and exhibit the kind of grace and cool headed headedness that she did um, when Donald Trump was president, in part because of all that experience and because of the years she'd lived and everything she'd been through. Um, and so I think we're regularly, even now as we're talking, um, experiencing the benefits of Biden's perspective um, and, of, and of his age. But there is a point um, at which what you project to the public is mixed and and people have doubts. And I, you know, I just go to the Democratic voter surveys. A, a pretty decided majority of Democrats do not want him to be the nominee again, do not want him to run again. And that's not because they're dissatisfied with him. It's not because they think he's a bad person. It's not because they're obsessing over Hunter Biden and his damn laptop or Hunter Biden's lap for that matter. Um, it's because they have concerns. It's Hunter Biden's hog is actually AP style on this podcast. Is that okay? Thank you. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm, 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 I'm bad about that stuff. From the cold practical point of view, if Trump and Biden are both the nominee, do you think the Biden age problem is largely neutralized or not at all neutralized or 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 something in between? It's it's a great question. I think I think Trump exists outside all categories. So when we talk about like young versus old, um Ozempic slim versus a little bit chubby and really in suits that hide it really well or very chubby in suits. Like every every category that we analyze politicians by, Trump is not in any of those categories. He's sui generis. He's a beast all his own. Um, I think if Trump is the nominee, the issue becomes what the issue was in 2020. Um, do we do we want what seems to be the stability of Joe Biden with whatever the lack of excitement is and whatever his flaws are, or do we want chaos and crazy town? Does chaos and crazy town mobilize and turn out the polls? See, I don't think Donald Trump has ever enjoyed anything close to a majority of to support from a majority of Americans. And I think the and I think the the raw percentages of Americans who can stomach the thought of another Trump presidency, I think we're probably talking well under 40 percent of Americans. But that's different from who is going to get the most votes in the Electoral College on Election Day. Um, one more question about our gerontocracy. And then I want to move on to the and kids. Tell, and tell me if I'm crazy, please. 
Because I mean, I am crazy, but if I'm crazy, I'm I, no, I, I think that's a fair assessment. I don't. I, I do think you. This is where you get into this danger zone, where some Democrats are like, we're kind of rooting for Trump because it would, in a certain way, neutralize uh, Biden's age, at least as compared to like. 45 year old he is or 44 however old Ron DeSantis like looks like he's 78 but somehow he's 44 so <laughs> no, he doesn't, he doesn't, mean, doesn't. I mean on. he doesn't look youthful I mean I'm, he I'm happy to hate youthful. on Ron DeSantis I mean, he looks but... like he could be my father if we were together and we are peers actually which is it's a little you which look is a little so young Tim thank you thank you Frank <laughs> I don't think mean, that's why though that would just I, mean that he had you you can see my wrinkles we can see my wrinkles luckily we're not on HD um uh, the <laughs> I forgot what I was supposed to be talking about old people Diane Feinstein <laughs> I loved your article about Diane Feinstein uh, because I am like a not so secret stan of her. I mean, she was good with the gays, and she's a hawk, and not much more that you want to get into my good graces. And um, you know, you it's in your article that was just a little bit of a zag. From I think there was a lot of frustration among progressives about her, some of her votes, the fact she was sticking around. They want to replace her with you know the perfect progressive you know vision for the future. Um, and and you, I think, wrote quite beautifully about like her long career and her career as an icon there was one little nugget in there though about how you got to spend a lot of time with her and she talked you know there was you know the way that she presented herself off the record was maybe different than what she was saying on the record so i'm just wondering if you have any memories insights about diane feinstein as we uh sent valedictory insights into her uh, well, I'm glad you asked about it because I do have enormous respect for her. I mean, I'm something of a stand, too, for some of the reasons you just mentioned, maybe not the hawk stuff so much. But, you know, you said progressives were never – she was never really a favorite of progressives and they want someone more progressive. Part of what I loved about her when I spent a lot of time with her – in when was that, like 1999, 2000? I lose track of time. Um, but also later is she didn't fit in any kind of neat box. Uh, progressives were unhappy with her. She certainly wasn't uh, Kirsten Cinema with like Republicans loving her. Um, we live in this era where, where most politicians end up towing the line of whichever caucus party they're supposed to be in. And I just love those people who refuse to do so. Her political positions felt to me genuine. Um, they were what she believed, and some of them caused her grief, and some of them didn't cause her any grief. And I just really respect that. I, I don't believe any of us um, is as easily kind of tagged and corralled as the parties that, that, that we belong to or that we end up supporting at the polls. Um, and I feel like Diane Feinstein, in that sense, is a vanishing breed, and I wish the breed wasn't vanishing. Um, as far as talking to her off the record, she was just one of those politicians when she was off the record. I mean, she told me exactly what she thought in all its nuances and wrinkles about the Clintons, um, that never came out when the tape recorder was on. And I'm not going to say anything more out of respect. There's, maybe there's a statute of limitations, but I'm not going to say anything more. Um, she was sassy. She was real. You know, I once did um, a long magazine piece on Hillary Clinton. And other than that, I had not spent much time with her. And I was blown away by how much fun it could be to ride around during an off the record period in a, in a car with Hillary Clinton. I mean, I will tell you this, and I guess I'm breaking an off-the-record rule, but Hillary and Clinton and I even had a conversation about which of her male colleagues in the Senate we thought were, were more and less attractive physically. That was off the record. And maybe she's going to... I don't think she's going to draw attention to what I just said, so I don't think we're going to kind of see it. Was John know. McCain... Lindsey Graham, where were they at the top? I, of the list? I'm, 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 I've, I've, I've done what I can with the statute of limitations <laughs> running out, but that's what, but my John point Thune, is, probably John Thune, but, pretty I, hot. I mean, you both have seen this probably more closely and in different ways than I have, and and you Tim, on some. As well, Jeb was like this, kind of, but uh, it always blows me away. Um, we we create a culture where so many politicians operate with such a profound sense of caution. And with such fear that the things that what, what makes them so what inspires the people who work for them, you know, what makes people like them enough to get them into the race disappears once they step out in front of the microphone, because now they are this kind of consultant, you know, washed, uh, cautious, fearful version. Um, Die Fi, Hillary, they're they're. One on one behind the scenes, they are funny and charismatic people in a way that that then va somewhat vanishes when they step out on stage. And that to me is a really sad part of politics. But it's um, but it, it also means people never know them. Truly. I think there is something to this about women. And obviously people immediately go to there's misogyny about this. Women get have are, are sort of this is ingrained in them as politicians. I, and I think that there's definitely something to that. But uh, but Jeb 
very much had this trait. You know, I, I think that there's also something that like that it's our political culture where maybe it's exacerbated with women candidates. And, and I don't, I didn't, I've never spent any time off the record with Kamala, but maybe well, this is a true. situation. Nikki Haley's her. totally genuine. This is a person <laughs> you get, is a, you know, is the same person who's in, on the TV screen. <laughs> That's Tim. true. That's true. I have spent some time with Nikki, and that is true. You know, she never lets off the mask. Um, oh my God. From our, from the olds to the kids, you're a Duke now. Which I, which I, you know, which well, is you, were, weird. you visited us recently. I, I did come to visit you recently, and I, I really enjoyed it. Um, the Duke kids do kind of fit the fit the stereotype a little bit. Not every so, kid, but you know, you're just so. walking around campus, and you got the, you know, the Brooks Brothers shirts Careful. and the khakis and the and the haircut. The haircut. They look like they might be going to McKinsey. There were a couple of, you know, there's well, most a of them are most of them are going to McKinsey, if not Bain, <laughs> right, if not right. Accenture, if not Deloitte. And so they look it. <laughs> and so they look it. Nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, we all uh, we all fit in our boxes from time to time. Uh, obviously, that there were there were exceptions to the rule. I liked being there, but you're a North Carolina guy. So that's a little bit of a was a little bit of a traitor, traitorous, I guess I would almost say. Yeah, I, well, I'm sitting here in Chapel Hill, um, not Durham, where Duke is. Yeah. They're, they're right next door to each other. Um, and I am a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill. Have you ever so. had like blood thrown on your uh, on the house, like on Duke Duke Week? Rams know? blood, right? No, Rams but I had blood. Some, <laughs> I tell you, I had something worse happen. I was the UNC Chapel Hill commencement speaker a year ago this May. Um, and, mm. you know, when right you're after commencing- that win. When you're a commencement speaker, like they kind of give a version of your bio when they give you the honorary degree on the stage. And then again, when you step up to give the commencement address, which in a football stadium of like more than 10,000 people is a pretty intimidating thing. I tell you, it's a lot more intimidating when the entire crowd boos when they mention Duke as your current Mm. position in biography. Try giving a speech to 15,000 people after you've been booed. Um, I do not want to relive that experience. I would rather have had blood thrown on my house because the rain because the rain would come along and wash it clean eventually whereas the memory of those boos will never be away from me that's just just echoing your ears at night i'm wondering we had juno diaz on last week who's at mit so i guess we're talking to two people pretty elite institutions but i'm interested to do your follow-up and his view was we're asking about this you know question of you know obviously on the right you hear Oh, the, you know, the kids these days, they're, they're so illiberal, they shut down all conversation, we've had the end of discussion, you know, you get shouted down if you have a contrary view to whatever their pieties are. Um, and, and, you know, Juno's view was that, you know, that the, the, the reality is more complicated than that, but that he does think that the universities do enable kind of that instinct. And I'm wondering what, what your experience is at a, at a different university. So I, I wish I'm going to go back and listen to that interview with Juno because I, I, I disagree. I mean, I agree, I'm sorry. I agree entirely in the broad strokes with the way you characterize what he had to say. Um, there is a problem on campus now. Um, I think students who don't believe or speak a certain way are afraid to speak. Um, and I do think that um, professors do not do an aggressive enough job of signaling to, uh, to their students um, that they can say what they want in the classroom and in signaling to those students who may be policing conversations that that sort of policing isn't accepted. Um, I have found, I've been honestly, maybe it's because I expected I was girded for something else. I've been happily surprised by the conversations that have occurred in my classrooms. Um, just a week ago, two weeks ago, I lose track of time. Um, I have a lot. I have a lot of people zoom into my classes. I'm teaching an opinion writing class this semester for the second time. A week and a half ago, a week and a half ago, I had Kevin Williamson zoom in because he and I are strange email buddies. Um, and the students certainly read up on him, and they read about the stuff that that got that Atlantic job offer retracted. Um, and we had a perfectly civil conversation, and and nobody complained. And and on we rolled to the next. Um, guest Zoomer, who will be tomorrow, Carlos Lozada, whom you're a fan of, I know. Um, so, uh, you know, so these disasters that are supposed to happen, they, they happen. The stuff you read about in the press um, is true, but it is somewhat cherry picked. Um, and, the, and the reality is a little bit more nuanced and complicated. You know, I, I taught um, a class on media ethics and media trends, and we talked at length about the 1619 Project. And I asked the students to respond in a kind of class blog to the question from the point of view of traditional news coverage and traditional news stories. Did the 1619 Project push the envelope um, in a good way or in a concerning way? You would have been surprised by the number of students who in that public blog that their classmates could see um, said, well, I, I have questions and problems with it for X, Y, and Z reason. I think if they get the signal 
from professors who are part of the problem, that they can speak their mind, that they can play with ideas. I'm teaching another class now where student after student, because of the signal that they've gotten, are, are writing essays where just to play with the ideas, they're taking um, a kind of quasi-conservative viewpoint. They're writing about like uh, the, the argument against Bernie Sanders, the argument against cancel culture. And some of them are saying to me, I don't really believe it, but, but I want to see what that sounds like. No, but I think that's a great thing. That. Yeah. So I think it's it's not as it's not quite the caricature, the negative caricature um, that you maybe read about in National Review. Um, it's much more nuanced than that. But the concerns that people have are legitimate concerns. So if that sounds mealy mouthed. No, it doesn't. I mean, do you think that there's something yeah. about Duke? I mean, obviously, we were stereotyping Duke earlier. I, I, you know, it's, I wouldn't exactly, you know, Duke's not liberty. But, you know, some of the kids that come to Duke, I think probably there, you know, it's probably more of a mix ideologically, maybe than, than some of these other schools. I think it's a little I, I think it's a little bit more of a mix. I think Duke is not Yale, is not Brown, right. is not Oberlin, for sure. Right. Um, but the average student at Duke, I think once you get to a certain tier, with the possible exception of the University of Chicago, the average student body is, is well left of center. Sure. But yes, I think you probably find more center and center right students at Duke um, than you would at some of those other schools. Um, I have yet to meet a student who's proud that Duke was the, um, was the cradle of Stephen Miller and of Eric Greitens. And I may be uh, losing Spencer. my job having highlighted those too. alumni. <laughs> and let's so I get should the full say Mount, I let's should... get the full white nationalist Mount Rushmore up there. It's just okay. So I should, I should, I should, I should quickly say, but our alumni also include <laughs> Tim Cook and Judy Woodruff and, you know, okay, there we go. Judy's great. I don't know about Tim at the Chinese sweatshops. <laughs> so, uh, Frank, how do you, this is a much more of concern to me than cancel culture stuff on campus is how you teach journalism students who, if they go into journalism or entering a field which has been devastated. Uh, and because when I talk to young people who are interested in journalism, I wave them off to the best I can. You it's know? funny. And uh, because, I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but your career is not possible in today's economic environment of media, I don't think. I don't think somebody could do what you did going from, you know, paper to paper and then working his way through, what, 85 different jobs at the Times. And that's not how it really works anymore. And I I am very fearful of 20-year-olds who want to make a career in journalism because I just don't know. There'll be plenty of jobs for them at age 23. I don't know that there will be jobs for them at age 40. Uh, that's a great concern, and I share it. And I'm not um, among the journalism professors at Duke. And I should hasten to add, we don't have a journalism department, and I believe in that. I mean, I went to UNC Chapel Hill. You could major in journalism. There's a journalism department. I didn't take a single journalism course. I, I wanted to take English and history courses. I felt like I could do my journalism at the campus newspaper, um, et cetera. And I wanted to make sure during those four years to like stuff myself with big thoughts and big words and some sort of historical timeline, all of which I've forgotten. And is amen. Know, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't. I don't cheerlead for journalism with my students. Most of the students I've taught, oddly, are not going into journalism. Like they're taking media or writing courses with me, like opinion writing. Um, but they're not going into journalism. They just kind of want to learn a little bit more about the media. They want to learn to be better writers. And I don't, when I see one that's really good, and I, I have this disagreement with some of my fellow professors, I don't immediately say, I'm going to convince you to kind of go all in on journalism because you're really talented, because I have the same concerns about their futures in the profession that you do. That said, it is correct that none of these students will have my career, which was kind of methodical and predictably choreographed, smaller paper, bigger paper, bigger beat, bigger beat. However, there are students today, there are people, young people in journalism today who will skyrocket to, to glory, to the top, in a way that you couldn't in, in, in my era. Well, sure, um, if they have a lot of, of TikTok social media followers. Media. Well, because right. of I mean, social, if or, or they break or they break a big one. And, you know, I mean, I think the rules are out the window and, and that means there's no guarantees. But there are also in isolated cases, limitless possibilities and a sort of kind of open field that wasn't that wasn't quite that way when I was, you know, back back when I was going to work in a, in a horse drawn carriage. I want to um, was it. <laughs> I mean, I think that you at least had 
combustion vehicles when you went to UNC, right? <laughs> yeah, I, well, we, did we? I don't remember. I mean, I don't think we had Novocaine yet, so there were very painful moments. Um, um, the, I want to I wanna speak, about, speak about the Youngs. I, I've, I, we have, I have another stereotype for you. I want you to either uh, debunk or confirm uh, for our listeners. I, they're riddled with anxiety. They, you know, uh, to get into a place like Duke, they had to have 90 different extracurriculars. You know, I, I follow this TikTok feed. This is, I guess, Ivy League acceptance week right now. So in my TikTok is like all the people getting rejected from Ivy's. And it's these people like 5.0, you know, it, they have their resume up there and then they show themselves crying, which is I just think a very bizarre, you know, sort of harikari uh, practice and mm-hmm. to begin with. But I... I what is your sense for that? And you're seeing these kids coming in. Like, how are they adjusting to all that? Are there things that we should be doing to try to, uh, you know, lessen that level of anxiousness? Oh, absolutely. And I don't know if you know this, but one of my, um, well, not that long ago, one of my books came out in 2015. Do, yeah, it's called, yeah, it's called Where You Go Is Not Who You'll Be an Antidote to the College Admissions Mania. So this is a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, the things we need to do, we need to do before they get to college. We need to do them at a pretty early moment. And, and we basically need to push back it and change this culture um, that says that um, where you go to college is going to uh, cast the die on your entire life, um, that the decisions you make from essentially kindergarten forward should all be made with an eye toward the perfect transcript, resume, whatever you want to call it, CV package that's going to please a bunch of strangers in Princeton, New Jersey, or Providence, Rhode Island, or Hanover, New Hampshire. Um, and we need to kind of just like explode and attack that thinking at a very early age, culture-wide, because it's not doing any, anybody any favors, because you do have, as you just mentioned, Tim, and you obviously have read up on this, you do have, you know, high rates of mental illness that are not, that are, that they're bigger, there are other causes than this, but this is absolutely, you know, an aggravating factor, a conspirator in that. And you have, and you then have the sensibility that's no good for these young men and women, and it's no good for the country. Um, they, they make value judgments, and, the, and they measure things in ways that are reflective of that entire path to college. Um, it doesn't lead to their contentment. It doesn't lead to their fulfillment. I, I, I've had so many students at Duke, and I taught at Princeton briefly years ago, um, who come into your office, and what they, what they really want to know is, what are the exact things I need to do yeah. to get an A? Just tell me how to get an A. And you want them, to, like, you know, when, I, when, you, when you have other students who come in, and I'm thinking of one in particular, and I was fortunate to have him in my very first semester, too. He would come to office hours and he would say, you've had a really crazy, all over the place, interesting life. Is it OK if I drop by occasionally and ask you questions about that? You know, I said to him at the end of the semester, I said, I realize full well, and I say this with great respect, you're an operator and you're going to do really well in life <laughs> because, you knew, because you knew you knew you were yeah. flattering me. I said, but at the same time, you were using me so much better than any of your classmates were. What you should be doing at college is is identifying really interesting people, identifying really interesting courses, and just making yourself bigger and brighter and more interesting than you were the day you came in. And you can't do that if everything is being done with an eye toward a 4.0 grade average. Um, And the eye toward a 4.0 GPA is a vestige of the way they've gotten to college. And it ends up being a kind of thinking and trajectory for their whole lives. And it's a real crime that we've done. This Some of to, these kids to, on TikTok have five point outs. I'm not even sure. I don't get that. That must be a new well, thing. Well, a, a lot of high, a lot Weighted of high schools. Weighted averages, Timothy. A lot of high schools give extra points for AP. I think colleges, yeah. it does top out at 4.0. Got it. Yeah. Uh, so, Frank, this is this is all well and good as a theoretical construct <laughs> for society to aspire to. But when you are at the, 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 the point of the spear, which is where I am, because I got a kid who's a fr- – my oldest is a freshman in college – or a freshman in college – freshman in high school now and starting to think about college stuff. Uh, it's a little hard to – to say I'm going to unilaterally disarm while the rest of the world is stockpiling nukes. Uh, so what is what? It, give me wisdom. What what should uh, parents such as myself? Because I I was very much an organization kid who was obsessed and plotted my you know from sixth grade on was plotting my extracurriculars and mapping out. Well, if I drop my lunch course. 
can I get an extra two hundredths onto my GPA by taking another class? Oh, yes, I can. Okay, I don't need to eat lunch for all four years of high, of high Can't school. Can't you just say to your yeah. kid, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting this question. Can't you just say to Flash, yeah. uh, by the way, I'm on the same podcast with somebody who skipped school to smoke weed and did not like to do any of those things and did not try it and, did, and got way worse grades than he should have. Based on his but look intellect. at what became of you, Tim Miller. And we became You're the a cautionary same. Tale. We became the same. That's what I'm saying. We became the same. So chill out, smoke a bowl. I, I guess so. So Frank, give me, give me, give me wisdom. Give me the wisdom that every every parent of a kid who's in high school should hear. Well, I mean, I, I, the wisdom. I don't know if it's wisdom. I never have anything approaching wisdom, but I'll make my take. I'll make take my best stab at it or swing at it, whatever. Um, but it's what I was just talking about. There are a lot of risks involved in not um, in not pushing back at that programmatic and that planned and approach to high school. Um, things may not turn. I mean, especially you know, given the the craziness um, and all the different kind of variables that keep rising and falling when it comes to what admissions offices weigh. There's a lot of risk in investing a kid, a young person, too much in what happens on decision day. Um, and, you know, if you're going to live by the sword, you may die by the sword. The, wi the wisdom is like, I, I just I just think it's a high stakes game to attach whether you feel your high school career was a, su a success, to attach whether you feel like you're getting the right launch in life, um, to whether you got into as exclusive a college as your classmate did. Um, I think you can send that message without uh, stomping on ambition or without saying, I mean, you're not saying don't aim for Yale, don't apply there. I mean, you're just saying like, keep that in a, in a, in a really healthy perspective. Um, and you, and you can say, look at Tim Miller, follow his look path. At Tim it's a very different and I want to go the yeah. other way, not the wisdom for the kid, the wisdom for the school. If the chancellor of these, of any of these schools, I, w I guess I won't put you on the spot about Duke. I don't want you to get in trouble with the boss, but if, if, if a chancellor of a prestigious school called you and said, Frank, what should we do differently? So that we are not like maximizing, you know, the amount of anxiety and self harm that we're pl that we're placing on these kids. Um, I would, first thing I would tell them to pull out of the U.S. news rankings. Um, Hundred uh, percent. Yeah, you used you used the yeah you used the phrase unilaterally disarm. Um, that's what that's what schools are afraid of if they do that. This has just happened at a very high level with law and medical schools, right? Um, that's not going to mean much unless it happens with undergraduate institutions. Now, Colorado yeah. College pulled out of the rankings, um, and they had a very respectable ranking among national colleges is the category they're in, but they were not ranked where Williams is. They were not ranked where Amherst is. You know, um, if, if a couple of the really big schools pulled out and, and, and in the PR about pulling out made it a big moral point, I think it could actually, other schools could feel pressure to pull out. Like they are actually the crasser institutions if they don't. And if all of them pulled out of U.S. news, that that has such metaphoric resonance and, 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 and sway, the U.S. news rankings. I think it would say to the world, there's a new day here. Um, I think it would then uh, encourage more schools to stop doing this horrible thing, which is called recruiting to deny. So the way schools like come up in the world is they is they beat the trees harder and harder for more applications. So that they've got all these all these young people applying who have no chance of getting in, but now you have twenty thousand people who applied for only three thousand acceptances, and you say to the world, "This is our acceptance rate." Right. Look and how that, selective we are, right? And now you've gone from Walmart to Nordstrom. Now you're Nordstrom, yeah. right? Um, but I think that I think that would happen less if there was this kind of first domino of pulling out of U.S. news. Frank, I'm like the Vince McMahon meme here with the ha. Ah, this is this is all and. But here's the thing. It, this this is not a pie in the sky thing. Because all it takes is like the HYPs of the world, right? You get Harvard, Princeton, That's and right. Yale all deciding to pull out, and then everybody else in the top tier has to pull out because if they stay, That's they right. look they look down market. And I look at some of these schools, Princeton, right? Princeton going through all of its uh, Woodrow Wilson reckoning with the uh, Wilson's history, and Georgetown did this with some era. These elite schools are willing to have hard conversations about their origins and some of their ties, but they're not willing to just pull out of the fucking U.S. news rankings. That makes no sense to me. It it doesn't, just, pulling out yeah. of U.S. news should be the easiest thing in the world if you have a 250-year legacy. 
I think that's very well argued and very well said. And, and, and the reasons I would say, oh, well, they're reluctant to pull out because of X, Y, and Z, those reasons don't contradict what you just said. I mean, I think you always have to think about money, right? Um, I, I'm at Duke. One of the things that makes Duke such a great school, I'm just talking Turkey, I'm talking Austria, is what an affluent of school it is. And I don't mean the affluence of the student body. I mean that, you know, because they have such devoted alumni, because they get such enormous donations from, from, from those alumni, um, we have a physical plant, we have classrooms, we have a faculty size that enables, I mean, I, I've set the limit at 12 students for many classes I've taught, and that's just fine. And you know what? That matters when you're teaching certain kinds of things. If you're trying to teach people how to write and you are, are line editing 12 papers versus 25, that's a very different experience for the student. Anyway, money does a lot of the talking here, but the same, all of those difficult things they've taken on have risked, have risked enraging alumni as much as pulling out of U.S. news rankings would. So no, I don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think it could happen. That's why I think it's not hard to imagine, if not HYP, HY or YP or HP pulling out, and it's not hard to imagine a domino effect to that. And and then I think we're and then I think we're lurching toward a new era. Um, I want to move on to your uh, writing career a little bit, um, and I'm going to butter you up like that one good student the first semester you had. So this is not a work though. This is just. I, earnest compliment. Before I give an earnest compliment, I have to do a very big wind up because I get so uncomfortable giving earnest compliments. Um, but uh, one thing I admire about you is just you haven't gotten bogged down in. I, I mean, JV also said your career path isn't possible, but your career path also is very strange, right? I, I get it is not typical, right? Like you, you are not, you've not gone the path of oh, I covered George Bush in two thousand. So now I'm covering Obama in 2008, and now I'm covering this, and now I hope to get on the Meet the Press panel, right? You went, you were a restaurant critic, you went to Rome, uh, you know, you've covered gay issues, you were the first gay columnist at the Times, your books, as you said, have been about, you've, you've written two memoirs, okay on that? Yeah. Um, yeah but uh, your books have been about writing and and eating, and like you've covered so much. Where, I, where did you find... You know, a any advice to somebody like me who doesn't want to write about Donald Trump my whole life, and 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 B, like, where did you find the confidence to be like, oh wait, I I can I can write about Rome, I can write about food, I I don't, I don't need to get caught in this lane of how people perceive me as a writer. Um, you know, I never had the confidence, and I don't have the confidence uh, today. Um, it's not kind of, it's hard to explain, but I'm I'm completely not confident at all and totally insecure, but. I, I kind of convinced myself because I wanted experiences and I wanted adventures um, that if editors, if, if seemingly intelligent, responsible editors who were caretakers of their institutions were willing to have me do certain things, then somebody uh, felt I was capable of it. And why not like trust their judgment and see what happens? Um, you know, when I was assigned to cover uh, W's 2000 campaign, I had done a bunch of um, local stuff on Chuck Schumer, um, but I hadn't really done that much political reporting. But I thought, if they think this is going to work out, who am I not to give it a shot? And on and on, Rome, restaurant, crit you know, um, and it wasn't about confidence. It was about the fact I'm not very smart about much, but um, I, I do think in retrospect, I was smart in the way I, I approached my journalism career. And even saying my journalism career feels weird to me. Um, I felt like journalism was this amazing passport to adventures. It was a ticket that got you into rooms where you had no place. Um, it was a ticket that put you on planes and in countries that you wouldn't see otherwise. And I always felt like if I didn't like punch that ticket in every way it could be punched, if I didn't if I didn't use that passport to breach as many sanctums as could be breached, then I was a fool because I was losing out on the experience. And I look back on my life and, and, and on my career and I have many regrets, but when I kind of towed up the celebrities I've profiled, the politicians whom I've spent off the record time with, as we were talking about before, um, the countries I visited, the earthquakes I've, uh, that have happened under my feet, it's just been really cool. Um, and so I, I put confidence out of the picture and thought, I'm not going to I'm not going to gauge these opportunities from the standpoint of whether I'm confident or not. I'm going to do them. I'm going to do them in, until someone tells me you, sh you schmuck, you screwed it all up. Go away. Um, your most recent book, The Beauty of Dusk, uh, which is my final earnest compliment here, which I love the title. Uh, who, I don't know who I don't know who did that, but it's a really it is a beautiful title of a book. Um, 
and uh, you deserve credit then. It wasn't uh, it wasn't some brilliant editor. You no, that was actually credit. mine. Other titles I don't deserve credit um, for, was, but that was, one was, was mine. It was really lovely. Um, there's a lot there, and uh, you know, you've done a bunch of, of interviews on this. Uh, the one thing I wanted to pull out from it is, I thought it was interesting, is that you said this experience that you went through, losing the sight in one eye, um, and reflecting on it, talking to other people who had who had gone through similar things, uh, a, a, a phrase you use is made aging less scary. Um, that's I, I just turned forty, so this is a tough one for me. Um, <laughs> aging is very scary for me, as as probably evidenced by all my gerontocracy because jokes you, in the first fifty you, minutes of this because podcast. Because you turned, because you turned forty, aging is scary. Okay, well, fine. Just don't make it about me then. All right, for the for others um, out there in the world for whom aging is still scary, like what what was it? What was the insights that you gained that that gave you that? maybe maybe distance from those fears um i mean really basic stuff you know i i encountered and still encounter some limitations that i didn't before um but i have found uh that the human being and i am much more adaptable than i realized um uh you come to understand how many kind of workarounds and how many sort of side roads there are in life um i live with i live with as we all do with profound uncertainty, but my uncertainty has like a name and it has contours. You know, I, I live with a 20% chance that my other eye will wink out and I will be blind. And I have found ways not to be terrified or undone by that. And that tells me that all of the other possible infirmities or actual infirmities of aging are going to be much, much more manageable than I thought they would. It's hard to distill, and and hopefully that's why I spent the space of a book trying to explain it. But um, I, I always come back to something that um, a very distinguished judge, um, David Tatel, who was on the U.S. Circuit District Court in D.C., the court that all the Supreme Court justices come from. I mean, that's how kind of high level he was. Um, and he went blind in his early 30s. When I met him, it was long after that. And I interviewed him for the book and got to know him and his wife. Um, and one one afternoon, uh, one e early evening, I was going with him from his chambers back to his apartment to have dinner with him and his wife. Um, and he was leading me through the streets of D.C. to the metro and leading me onto the metro. He was doing all of this from memory and from like what's called echolocation. He could like listen to his environment and extract more information from that than someone who hasn't been forced into that position can extract. And we sat down on the on the metro and I knew him well enough at that point to know that he wouldn't feel kind of condescended to or patronized. And I said, David, I just have to tell you, I'm in awe of, of what we just did. I thought I was going to be, I thought you were going to be holding my arm and I was going to be leading you to the metro. Um, and that's not how it went down, as you know. And he said to me, you know, Frank, um, starfish can regrow limbs and that's nothing compared to what people can do. And if you actually kind of look around you with a certain inquisitiveness and you take a full survey, you see proof of that all over the place. And to see that proof and to dwell on that proof is to be much much less scared about the uncertainty in your life and about aging and that sort of thing. We know about echolocation from Finding Nemo. I have, I have one more question, follow up before we get to the rapid fire. Um, Which scares uh, me. No, the 20%, the rapid fire should scare you. The 20%, um, the 40%, something that struck me, you didn't write about this, but I, it made me wonder, um, is, is you kind of lived with this a little bit through the AIDS crisis, right, in the 80s, right? Like as a gay person, I, I didn't, you know, luckily I came of age kind of after the acute portion of the AIDS crisis, at least. Um, and even still, you feel like you live through this as a gay person, where like every time you go in for a, for a you know, check, uh, you know, for getting your blood drawn in your head, you feel like you have a 20% chance of something horrible coming out, even if that's not really true. I'm just, I'm wondering yeah. if you like leaned on that at all, that experience. You know, it, it, it's funny. I think it's a great question. And, and that may have been somewhere. It wasn't something I consciously experienced. Yeah. Um, the AIDS crisis is funny because not, it's not funny, but I mean, it was uh, to a gay man of my age, it was so central to your life in your early 20s, mid 20s. Um, you know, you, you went to act up meetings, you, you went to funerals, right. you know, um, at, a, at a stage of life. It is so strange how once we were past the AIDS crisis, how quickly and this, there's some danger in this, but how quickly it receded. Um, from being like conscious and, and present. And I know other gay men of my age feel the same way. Um, and sometimes that worries me because I, I, I wonder if we if we held on to and extracted all the lessons we should. Um, but that, too, is sort of something that speaks to human resilience. We're really yeah. good um, at kind of optimizing 
the situation and what's ahead. Um, and so for some reason, I wasn't thinking a lot about AIDS, except in one sense. Um, when something bad happens to you of a medical nature, when something as scary happens to you as what happened to me, and there's much, 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 much scarier, um, you have to avoid the trap of self-pity. And one of the things that I think you can do or you do do or that I did is you sort of kind of towed up like all the ways in which you've been extremely fortunate. And I remembered, I did pause and remember how many men my age, how many acquaintances and friends um, were not as lucky as I was and died from AIDS. And I thought to feel sorry for myself um, for what I'm going through in my late 50s when all these people so similar to me didn't even reach their late 50s, like that is the height of being an asshole. <laughs> You have to choose gratitude, right? This is the the one of the keys to having a happy life is uh, cultivating the ability to choose gratitude. Yeah, you you can tally your slights or you can tally your blessings, yep. and doing the latter is so much smarter and so much more happy making. That's wonderful. Okay, here we go. We'll rapid fire. We'll do uh, this first one. Might not be quite as rapid. The rest of them will be. But I'm wondering something you've changed your mind on later in life. As never Trumpers. We're, all, we're cultivating gratitude, but also cult, uh, cultivating reviewing all the things we are wrong about in the past that led us to this moment. So I like getting that insight from other people. What, what's something that you feel like you've changed your mind on in, in adulthood? I'm much, more co- I, I'm much more concerned than I was as a, as a youth in excessive government regulation. Um, I don't know right. if you read Ezra Cl- yeah, I don't know if you read Ezra Klein's really terrific column, um, uh, and Ezra's to the left of me, but his terrific column in the Times yesterday called The Problem with Everything Bagel Liberalism. And he was talking about how regulation upon regulation upon regulation is why you can't build home- housing for the homeless in San Francisco. Right. Um, and it was a great piece because I think it's something too many liberals have not reckoned honestly with, which is, you know, you want this to be regulated, you want that to be regulated, you want this protection, you want that protection, add them all together and you have... Um, a degree of, of, of civic and ex- economic constipation that works against what your goals supposedly You're are. You're preaching to the choir here. No wonder you named your dog Reagan. Um, okay. Uh, Regan. Oh, Regan. I'm sorry. Regan. Re- Regan. Okay. I had, I had Regan. it as Reagan. Um, fellow column. For Don Regan. <laughs> and <for> Don <laughs> Regan. Wow. Exactly. Exactly. Fellow columnist whose output you're the most jealous of. Or, uh, or writer that's not a columnist, I guess. Well, right, right. I mean, right now, I mean, this is just at the moment, um, it seems to me that David French is writing up like a, a, a three or four time a week storm. It's annoying. And, and I'm getting tired just reading it. And I mean that as a compliment. Same. I don't mean it. Yeah, yeah. So David French at the moment. Who is the best colleague you've had in your journalism career? Best in what sense? The best to you. Who's been the best colleague? You know, in, in her in her quirky and inimitable way, Maureen Dowd. Knew that was coming. I want your LGBTQ plus American Mount Rushmore. We're building a Mount Rushmore. We're, we're chiseling people into stone. Who is, who is on there? These are tough. How, how am I supposed <laughs> to do these rapidly? <laughs> well, this is, you know, this is, this is the fun of the game. It's just your, it's just who comes to mind. Oh my God. Um, I'm drawing a total blank on that. You were the sorry. first and New York Times columnist, gay columnist, you know, so maybe other people would put yeah, you on Yeah, but you know, it's, 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 like, it's like when people ask me, like, what's the one restaurant I should go to? When, when, you're, when you're little, I'm going to really date myself here. Okay. When your little card of index folders has too many index cards in it, okay. you're, I mean, like, you're, you know, those things, then yeah. you, don't, you can't pick out one. Okay. Well, the answers are it's Harvey Milk, okay? It's RuPaul. It's whatever your favorite twink is at a given moment. Troy Sivan for me right now, and now Wild Card. So you know, now you only have, I have one. To I, add. I don't have. I don't. I don't have twink fascinations okay. in my well, life. I'm fine. sorry. That's, about that's that. fine. <laughs> fine. Okay. Boring. But uh, we'll ask the readers. To I'm send, sorry. We'll, I'm no, whatever we'll do. We'll ask the readers to send in an LGBTQ plus Ooh, Mount Rushmore. We'll send it to you. I like the idea. I will. Th- I will think Pray about it. it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll write a column on it yeah, at some point good. when the answer comes to me. Yeah. All right, so you you just taught a class on op-ed writing. Uh, who is the worst <laughs> op-ed writer in America? Who's who's the the writer who you said to your to your students, "Don't ever be like this." Not going there. <laughs> Not, there's, there's there's no there's no upside. Come to on, that. sure, there are a lot of easy ones. No, nope. wow, no, nope. nope. Frank okay. Bruni. Uh, well, Fine, I'll, I'll throw, I'll one, throw this at you then. You are stranded on a desert island. You can have one periodical subscription. Who do you choose? Right now, The Atlantic. 
Mark Thiessen was the answer to the other question, by the way. Mark Thiessen. You don't have to. You can just blink or. Oh, you blinked. Um, okay. Uh, Frank Bruni, <laughs> thank you so much. I thought much. it was Hugh Hewitt. Uh, no, so no, no. But wait a second. Why were you so surprised by The Atlantic? Because uh, it's monthly. I would oh. New Yorker because it's weekly. If but I'm on a see, desert island, I want the New Yorker because I need it see, every week. So this is this is the problem. I'm such an idiot that I was forgetting that my island didn't have wireless. <laughs> and I no, no, I'm serious. So I, I experience periodicals as like a slow drip uh, yeah. on the internet across sure. the month. I, I actually Me too. I have an online subscription to the Atlantic, but not a print one. Atlantic. So I don't been. even ex- I don't even experience it as a print entity. Atlantic would have been my answer too. New York Magazine close, but I wouldn't. Atlantic's I wouldn't need great. that much. Don't get me wrong. Love the life. Atlantic. Uh, did you see Triangle it's a, it's of a, Sadness? It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's about the abundance. You, I did see Triangle of Sadness so, in all of its in all of its vomit and diarrhea. And they didn't yes, have did. any you know internet on their island. No, but there was a resort on the damn <laughs> island. They just had to go over the mountains and there. Oops! Spoiler alert! Ah! ah bad, anyway, bad, trying to go that is wonderful. Frank Bruni, I, I just, I'm eternally grateful that you did this. Uh, thank you for hanging out with us. Um, hopefully we can do it again another time and uh, I can get invited back to Duke. We'll see you all next time at the next level. Peace out.